Hello, it's Ashton. And it is John. What's up, guys? We are back with another reaction video. In today's video, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be reacting to... Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Season 1 Re-Upload History of Power Rangers. You didn't do it right. I didn't. You got to say it like the narrator did back in the day when we were kids. I Mighty never... Morphin Power Rangers. Okay, I never watched it. So what? I, never... no, I hated Power The Rangers. movie? No, I hated it. I never saw it. The ooze? See, everybody gets mad because I don't see any of this stuff. Because I, I feel like just... there's staple marks from being a kid in the 90s, and Mighty Morphin Power Rangers was a staple mark. Like, something that you have to get. It was like not knowing about Spongebob in the early 2000s. For me, though, and I can't really describe it, I was just a different kind of a kid. I didn't sit and watch much TV. I was always outside, constantly. Yeah. Like, I grew up in the country, you know, and so... I was always out riding the four wheeler and hanging out with friends, and I was never inside the house. So I, and when I like literally, you guys, I was, I think eight years old when I had moved to the city that we live in now, and um, that's when I was first introduced to SpongeBob. People were watching SpongeBob before that. Like I don't remember what year SpongeBob started. Nineteen ninety nine, two thousand. Yeah, so I would have been five six years old so yeah. i didn't get to start watching that until i moved into the city because we had like what they call bunny ears which you know that's you get like five channels or something like that i don't know we so first of all that's probably the hugest reason why i didn't see this or most of this stuff because and you're we, a girl too so we had yeah i i i have you know there's a lot of girls that have seen this stuff because they have siblings that'll watch it or you know, they just ended up watching it for God knows what reason they were interested. But I wasn't. I was always into, like, girly stuff. Always. My whole life. And I never really watched TV either because we didn't have many channels. Right, right. No, I feel you. I just, you know, I was, I was like a country girl. I was always outdoors. I never really watched. I remember it was mainly, like, Goosebumps. Goosebumps and, was awesome. Yeah, like, like Chucky. All the Chucky movies, Goosebumps and... We had, like, the Disney movies. My mom and dad bought us tons of those. But other than that, we didn't watch anything. That's crazy. Just mm -hmm. scary stuff in Disney movies. Mm -hmm. um, guys, this is from the channel Linkara Atop the Fourth Wall. Link is down below in the description so you can get to that channel easier. Very important to support the channels that you love. Suggestion from Dragon Trainer 201 Thank you so much for the support. You guys can also help support the channel if you want to. Just click on the link down below in the description. If you go around through Streamlabs, it's going to let you pick on the next videos that... We react to just keep it under ten minutes. Include the videos link title your email. Let's get I to just this. I feel like so many people get annoyed with that on YouTube. What's that? That I haven't. That I don't know any of this stuff. I like know. what movies? You and should. Games. You know, honestly, being a girl, Power Rangers is just something you heard of, not something you've watched. And I think about I it, mean, and it's like a lot yeah. of the stuff that's suggested to us. We, I, I don't. I've never played or I've never watched. And I'm just like, damn, I'm fucking lame. But honestly, I just had a different childhood. That's all it was. Oh, I feel you. I feel you. Let's get to that video. It's Rita. She's escaped and she's attacking the planet. Teleport to us five overbearing and over emotional humans. No, not that. Not teenagers. That's correct, Alpha. I was afraid of that. Hey, thanks, Zordon. It's only the fate of the frickin' planet at stake. Has someone changed the water we filter in your tube teenagers. lately? Ladies and gentlemen and others, welcome to Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Season 1. I know the song. <laughs> Five years ago, I started a little project called History of Power Rangers. I had done a Power Rangers homage on Atop the Fourth Wall and decided to re-watch the show, and in my rewatch, I had crazy theories and ideas that popped into my head. So I wanted to share those thoughts with people. To make matters worse, I decided to do it for every season, giving comprehensive analysis and recaps of the entire show, even for seasons that I hadn't watched before. Those videos were hosted on a service called Blip.tv that sadly no longer exists. Oh, While the original videos still exist, a lot has happened over the last five years, at the time of this recording anyway. Most... Fun fact, if you guys didn't know this, do you want to share it? What? The Power Ranger dude that got in trouble. Which one was it? It was the red one. He was from, he wasn't from the main season though. He was no. from a, a different season. I think of it. he was like a <clears throat> I don't know if it's like an extra actor like just a in stunt case. Stunt double or something yeah. for the Red Ranger, I think. I don't I, we don't know the whole the details of it, but anyway, he He killed somebody with a sword. Yeah. He got charged with murder. Yeah. So, That's pretty intense. But it was the Red Power Ranger. 
not the official not one. Not season one Power Rangers. I like think it was like a... Season two or three or something like that? It was just temporary. I don't know. Anyway, yeah. you guys can look it up and do your own research. We don't know the whole storyline of but it. But it is crazy. Just a fun fact I had to let you guys know if you didn't know it, so... Prominently for me is that I am on YouTube now. When I began YouTube. rebuilding my presence on YouTube, I re-uploaded all those videos. Sometime later, however, I was hit with two copyright strikes from Toei, the company that owns and produces Super Sentai, and the videos were all taken down. However, these videos have been one of the most popular things I've ever produced, and I like being able to pay rent. As yeah. such, I have decided to re-edit all of my History of Power Rangers videos and put them up again, making them more YouTube-friendly. At the time of this nice. video's creation, Samurai and Megaforce have had that done and are viewable through links on my website, since the videos are unlisted and I prefer to keep my channel's video uploads in order when possible. Okay, I just want to say, I think it's so stupid when people do that. Actually, it's a form of advertisement. Like... Yeah, you might lose out some views, but you're going to have so many people go to your channel and check out your content when other people are reacting to it or making um, videos on it. And there's revenue sharing now. So if somebody's using your video, you just check that and then you literally get all the payment for any time that your stuff You get like 75% yeah, or some huge. crazy percentage. But if you guys are YouTube creators and people are reacting to your stuff or people are making videos like this guy, take it as like a... Right. A Claim. beneficial thing because it helps your channel. It helps with, like, right. they're advertising for free for you. I know, and a lot of times they end up getting paid for it anyway instead because it goes right to them and the reaction. I don't know. I think it'd stuff. be cool if people reacted to your stuff, you know, like, if people reacted to our stuff. I'd be like, oh, cool, you know, because it shows that somebody likes our stuff or right. it helps other people see our stuff. It's all fair use as long as you got your face according to the 2019 rules, so. The audio of all these videos will remain mostly the same, with occasional exception like cutting out my breathing, making corrections to things I got wrong, or reducing the amount of continuous footage that I show. This video, however, is most likely to get the most amount of attention, because most people don't even seem to realize that Power Rangers kept going after Mighty Morphin, and as such I felt it necessary to fully re-record the video it so it actually sense. sounded somewhat professional. Then again, I've probably lost most of you by now anyway since it's taken me this long to get to the damn point and my only real joke so okay, far cool. has been about zordon's tube speaking of has anyone fed him lately i'm sure we've got the fish flakes around here somewhere <laughs> anyway right. the point is if this is your first time here welcome to the history of power rangers an opinionated and serious analysis of a children's show utilizing japanese footage mixed with american footage about rubber suited monsters getting punched by people in spandex and with a premise like that you can see why it deserves serious analysis because this is a biased perspective, I fully expect people to lob hate at me for disagreeing with their opinions, and that's all right. This series is not a comparison to the source shows that Power Rangers uses footage from, collectively referred to as Super Sentai. I have no interest in the Sentai. Not that I question its quality, it's simply a matter of me not caring about it. All of us have heard from friends and loved ones about something that is a must-see, something that is the best ever, and that we do ourselves a disservice to not see it. But in the end, there's still stuff we don't see simply because we're not interested. And in this case, I grew up watching Power Rangers, and it is Power Rangers that I have come to praise or berry, depending on the season. I will refer to the Sentai occasionally from what little I do know, thanks to the efforts of others who have written up explanations for some of the more bizarre things that Power Rangers occasionally does, but my information is usually secondhand, so remember, it's possible the information I have is wrong. By that same token, I am not at this time interested in Super Sentai's sister series, Kamen Rider. Kamen Rider will have some influence in a few seasons, but for now, it's just not my so thing. Like that being said, the current highest milestone goal of my Patreon, assuming you aren't watching this years later after Patreon has become a sapient being that was forced to be destroyed through chemical warfare combined with appealing to the best traits of humanity. He said this was made, well, this was re-uploaded um, yep. and re-done, but what year was it? Do you know? 
You just hit this button. Uh, this was oh. 2018, so not too long ago. Okay, never mind. I thought that this was like an older video. I was like, Patreon was around way back then. Right. Like 2013 no. or something. I didn't think so. The is to review other American shows that are like Power Rangers, including VR Troopers, Beetleborgs, and yes, Common Rider Dragon Knight. So if you want to see that happen, feel free to send some support my way. I am not reviewing the first Power Rangers movie for a simple reason. It has nothing to do with the show story-wise. For 20 plus years, Power Rangers has enjoyed a mostly continuous continuity, some seasons leading directly into the next with recurring characters, but the movie takes place in its own separate universe and I feel no need to cover it. For a more comprehensive look at it though, I did a review of a comic adaptation of it on Atop the Fourth Wall. With all that out of the way, let's talk about the first season. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers was an idea that Haim Saban had had for several years in the 80s, in particular in 1986 producing a pilot for adapting the Sentai Bioman. Saban and partner Shuki Levy were mostly known at the time for composing music for kids shows, including but not limited to Inspector Gadget, He-Man, and the real Ghostbusters. Saban loved the idea of mixing the Japanese and American footage, saving production costs a ton, but unfortunately no one was interested in it. According to Levy, Saban carried a video cassette of it around and kept pitching it to networks. And they all thought it was the worst thing they'd ever seen. In 1988, Saban formed his own production company and made several shows, including the hit that was the X-Men animated series. Oh, However, in the early 90s, Margaret Loesch, the head of Fox Kids, was looking for a new series that'd be adventurous, fun, and silly, and Saban showed her the Bioman pilot. Loving the idea, they refined the concepts and negotiated with Toei for a different, then more recent Sentai, Kyoryu Sentai Jew Rangers, and thus Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, Rangers? was born. The series yeah. begins <laughs> somewhere in space. The implication has always been that this is the moon, although in the Sentai it was not. But as the show progresses, we'll learn that the moon is weird in the Power Rangers universe. There's a breathable atmosphere, for that matter, an atmosphere at all. The gravity is normal, and we're still landing on it. Now, in some circles, people debate about whether or not this isn't actually just some other planetoid near Earth, but since future instances will refer to the villains being on the moon, we're gonna call it as such. Anyway, two astronauts find what's called a dumpster, hence the title of the first episode, Day of the Dumpster. That's something else I never got. It's not a dumpster, it's a bin or a barrel. Maybe you can get away with calling it a trash can, but yeah. most right. trash cans aren't made of stone or have yeah. jewels engraved in them. But anyway, the astronauts decide to not radio in that they found an alien object, but instead decide to open the quote-unquote <laughs> dumpster, releasing Rita Repulsa and her band of freaks, her gorilla knight Goldar, her monster maker and scientist Finster, and the comic relief duo of Squat and Babu. Rita Repulsa is a sorceress often referred to as an empress of evil, because alliteration makes you sound cooler than a sorceress of mild irritation. Anyway, she spent 10,000 years in the dumpster and now wishes to conquer the first planet she sees, Earth. As you saw before, Zordon, the big giant head, detects Rita's escape and decides to assemble a team of five teenagers to combat her. And let's meet those teenagers now. In other installments, we'll save character stuff for the end, but the problem with these early seasons is that while the characters have personalities, they don't have much in terms of an arc. First is Jason, the Red Ranger who teaches a karate class. He is stoic and confident. Zack, the Black Ranger, is Jason's best friend and teaches what he refers to as hip hop aikido, basically combining breakdancing and fighting. Admittedly, that's kind of stupid in hindsight, but actually it does make for some impressive fighting moves. And some silly ones, but hey, on my show I've got a ninja style dancer, so who am I to judge? Next, there's Trini, the Yellow Ranger. Okay, let's comment on this. Yes, the Black Ranger is black and the Yellow Ranger is... I was gonna say that when he's like, the Black Ranger, and I was like, thinking about it. I didn't want to say it because I try to filter myself on our reaction channel because people get pissed. But I was like, why did they go meet the Black Ranger, the Black... The Yellow Ranger, the, the Pink Ranger and then, is a girl, and, then, and the then, White Ranger is a white guy. What's going on? Yeah, and then when they showed her, they're like, the Yellow Ranger, I'm like looking at her shirt. Okay, she's wearing yellow. Hey, she's... They, they didn't make the Red Ranger Indian. Well. I but... guess that one they didn't do it on. Okay. Um, you want to... What? I just got to open the door. It's a cat trying to get in. Cat's trying to get in. There she is. I'm in. If we don't let the cat in, she will tear up the carpet. She will literally just try to anything to get through that door. Yeah, Explosives. She's, she's got claws, obviously, so she'll tear that carpet up. She found the auger again. 
worst is Asian. Let's get this out of the way. They honestly did not realize what they had done in casting until about the 10th episode. It was an honest, if horribly racist mistake, <laughs> and they rectified it in future casting. Mm -hmm. Most of the time. There were Most actually a few time. pilots made of the first episode, even originally taking place in a bowling alley instead of the juice bar that is used for the social gathering point in the show. In at least one of those pilots, Trini was played by actress Audrey Dubois, who is not Asian. Although ironically, Tommy, who would later become the Red Ranger, was a character with Native American connections. Whoops. Anyway, Trini is also- Wait, Tommy became the Red Ranger? He was the Green Ranger, and then he becomes the White Ranger. When was he the Red Ranger? Yeah, I thought he was the White Ranger. He just showed who the Red Ranger was. It was the dude who was teaching the martial arts class. Maybe I'm a martial it. artist, but it's harder to get a gauge on her character. She's probably the least developed of the original team. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that the actress who played her, Twee Trang, tragically passed away in a car crash in 2001. What? Trini served Damn. the purpose of translating that? the technobabble of the next character, Billy. Yeah. Billy is the stereotypical brainy nerd, yet if you see him without bulkier clothes, his physique is actually on par with the others on the show. Billy will be a mainstay of the show for the longest time, even after he stops being a Power Ranger. And finally, Kimberly. The second to last of the original five to leave the series, she is the stereotypical valley girl, a gymnast who loves the mall, and etc, etc. Like Billy, because of how long she stayed on the show, her character will develop beyond the superficial qualities we see in the early days. However, it's also time to meet the real stars of the show. Oh, snap. Yes, these dudes were hilarious. Oh no, look who's here. Bulk and Skull. Bulk and Skull last through six seasons of Power Rangers and are the characters that have the most development over the course of it. What started as comic relief bullies evolved into two characters who nobly stood up to evil. I love these two. They're like the three yes. stooges of my generation. Yes, their comedy was often quite predictable, but they added some much needed levity during some of the darker I'm turns sure of the did. first few seasons. Sit down. Oh boy. The building's about to fall down. I'm not finished with my ice cream yet. <laughs> Often, their comedy subplots were actually more interesting than the plot of the episodes, and they I remained some that. of the most popular characters on the show. Even if they began as bullies, though not particularly good ones, since it was obvious any one of the rangers was capable of kicking their asses, these are the two that went through the most changes. Since they are the longest-lasting cast members of the original, and the only ones with an arc, I consider them to be the actual main characters of the show. Incidentally, it turns out their first names are Farkas and Eugene. Yeah, I don't know. In real life or in the show? Too. While there can be very life. good character moments no, in the show, Rangers, they tend to be a bit on the bland side. They're always trying to be goody goods. I, always guess he, I assumed he meant in real life, but he could have meant in the show. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know, but I remember the Bulk and Skull. Era. Either way, those are awful names. Yeah. Talking about teamwork, friendship, the heart of the card, blah, blah, blah. In a show that really liked having clear-cut heroes and villains, Bulk and Skull stood in a gray area for quite a while, and their ultimate nobility served as a perfect capstone to their characters. While in the first season they served primarily as bullies, there were times when their better nature shined through. Two specific examples come to mind. The first is <laughs> when they adopt a pig. Now, ultimately, the pig proved know. to just be a Ugh. monster, and it's they were frightened like of it when that pig. happened. My but they seem to actually one. be nice to it and want to take care of it after adopting it. The mm. other is in the episode Crystal of Nightmares, where the two are put into a dream state. And what do they dream about? Becoming superheroes and saving the world. Now, in the dream, they can't drive the Megazord properly, but I think the fact that they want to be good guys, even if they are selfish and inept, will help come into play in later seasons. But now, back to the plot. Rita launches an attack on Earth, causing an earthquake to develop. As people jog lightly out of the juice bar in panic, the five teens suddenly decide to stay exactly where they are, planted to one spot, before being teleported away by Zordon. Zordon Crazy, explains right? the plot of the show, that they have to fight Rita using morphers that will harness the power of ancient beasts like dinosaurs, the saber-toothed tiger, and the mastodon. We also meet Alpha 5. Alpha can get pretty annoying early on with his constant proclamations of ay 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 Yes. But he's ultimately harmless and serves the purpose of being able to help do all the things Zordon can't do since, you know, he's dude doesn't have hands. The teens don't buy any of this, which I guess isn't that surprising, but one would think the teleportation, tube head, and robot would be compelling evidence. Rita is somehow able to discern that Zordon is doing all of this, and while we learn later that no one can enter the command center without a 
Power Coin, the source of the Morpher's power, she does send a squad of her foot soldiers, the Putty Patrol, to attack and kill the Rangers. The, putty the Putties Patrol. are pretty cool. Sure, it's just a guy in gray spandex, but it's the face that really makes it. Kind of mm. like a deformed Cyberman face. Yeah. What's amusing to me in hindsight is that if she hadn't attacked them, they very well may have never become Rangers, since during the fight they decide to use the Morphers and, for the first time, become the Power Rangers. Since this is lifted from the Sentai footage, they are immediately teleported into a city to use that footage. They also get their <laughs> Zords, the giant robots that, well, let's be honest, most of the time the individual Zords are pretty useless. Sure, sometimes they'll use them individually, but hey, it's cooler to have a big single robot instead of five smaller ones. True the original that. Megazord is classic. From the horns, to the big ass chest, to the power sword, it's just iconic. I love it because it's just so simple. A big blocky robot that looks like it can kick your ass. Kind of has an Optimus Prime face going for it. <laughs> One of the recurring elements of a lot of seasons is that the Red Ranger Zord usually gets the most screen time and also an alternate mode, or just an alternate Zord altogether, while the rest basically just exist to be combined into the Megazord. As a first season, especially the earlier episodes, there were a lot of goofy ideas that were put in because they were still finding out their place and how they wanted the show to work. For example, in the second episode, we see this super duper martial arts move. Zach! Ready! Locked on! Go! Let's do it! <laughs> okay, that's pretty good. <laughs> That's so dumb in real life, yeah. though. Yeah. Like that scene in Matrix Reloaded with Neo it's spinning funny. on a stick in perspective, doesn't it? Yeah. Elements seen in the first few episodes wouldn't really make any reappearances later. For example, the Rad Bug. The Rad Bug is one of the silliest, most illogical things Power Rangers ever did. Billy invented a flying car that could enter the command center somehow. We have to assume he used technology from the command center to build this thing, because otherwise Billy just invented a flying car out of crap that he had in his garage. That's crazy. And you know what? It's awesome. <laughs> Why the hell didn't they ever bring this back? By the 17th episode, we had what was probably one of the best things they ever did for the series and has had a lasting impact to the point where even the advertising for the final episode of the season 20 years later was all about his return. Jason David Frank as Tommy Oliver, the Green Ranger. Love him or hate him, this was the character that really cemented Power Rangers for the audience. He's in a five-part story, since this was in the days when new episodes of the series were shown <clears throat> on weekdays, called Green with Evil, Rita unveiled her plan to create her own evil Power Ranger, the Green Ranger. Where she got the Power Coin, we'll never know, especially given what we learn later concerning their creation. Unfortunately... He, like, immediately became your favorite character as soon as he turned into the White Ranger, just like that, in the movie. That's what really cemented it for me, for to make him my favorite character. Because he was evil, and then he became a good guy once they broke the spell or whatever it was she had over him. It's been a long time, but... I see, and I don't know any of that because I didn't watch it. They, so. they always made him to be the, the badass of the group. The Green as Ranger is also where we see Power some Rangers. of the seams fall apart between Japanese and American footage. In the Sentai, the Green Ranger had a rubber shield, whereas the American one was cloth, since sadly they had to make do with what they had, and sometimes suits and props are damaged in transit, assuming they get sent at all. It's pretty shabby and terrible looking, sadly. Also, trivia note the crew would routinely lose the morpher props so they would just go out to the toy store and buy a morpher in order to use it for the show if they had to the toys were just that accurate Damn. in any case That's the green crazy. ranger was where things suddenly got Smart, interesting though. Yeah. for one thing the fact that it was five parts long showed us that this was an epic like no other no other kid shows did five parters at the time and the guy was just badass he wasn't some weird ass monster with a goofy gimmick he was an actual human being who was able to outfight the Group. He looked different, his weapon was different, and he had a Zord that rivaled the others, rising from the ocean like Godzilla. He wrecked the command center, cut the rangers off from the guidance of Zordon, and even got into the Megazord to disable that as well. Each episode felt unique, telling a new chapter of the tale as we saw the rangers having to really step up their game. Billy becoming more acquainted with the technology of the command center, Jason being put in mortal peril as he's kidnapped and has to face Goldar and the Green Ranger without being able to morph. It's glorious. It also introduced another general for Rita, Scorpina. In my original version of this video, I neglected to mention Scorpina. 
because she has no impact on anything. Okay. She's in the first season here and there, appears again at the beginning of season two, reappears for another episode in the season, and that's the end of her. Ultimately, the Rangers broke the spell Rita had placed on Tommy, and he officially joined the team. It's just a really well-written and suspenseful story, in my opinion. They also started the first official romance with Tommy and Kimberly, which, while not really going anywhere with the relationship beyond their dating, it's mostly notable for the fact that they're pretty much the only couple in Power Rangers allowed to kiss. Over time, the show settled into its standard format of issue of the day, monster, zord fight, and finally tawdry resolution of the issue at the end. End. While they usually are actually pretty good about their own continuity, there's the occasional bizarre hiccup. For example, there's an episode called Life's a Masquerade, a rather enjoyable episode. standalone really? episode yeah. featuring some... See, I, we, I think we did actually get this channel when we lived out, when I was younger, when we lived in, in the country, but my brother was the one who watched it. Yep. Like, I know for a fact we got the channel, but I just hated it, you know, at that age because I was really little. But I remember that episode right there because of the way that the girls dress. Mm -hmm. Some great bits by Bulk and Skull. Uh -huh. Where Rita introduces her super putties, nearly indestructible versions of her old putties. The problem is that the episode right before it, Gung Ho, already introduced the Super Putties, and the group reacts with shock at the premise of the Super Putty both times. Gung Ho is notable These for another fools. aspect, the introduction of a new Zord, Titanus. It's a big Brachiosaurus-looking thing that could combine together with the Megazord and Dragon Zord to become the Ultra Zord. Because remember, kids, the only thing cooler than one giant robot is a bunch of giant robots merging together to become an even bigger robot. Mm -hmm. Anyway, eventually the show ran into a bit of a problem. See, a lot of the fight scenes were dependent on the Sentai footage, and well, there was only so much of it, particularly of the Green Ranger, since his Sentai equivalent actually died partway through Jew Ranger. Now, they solved that issue by writing him out of the show. In the two-parter, The Green Candle, Rita unveils a magic... So he died in real life? No. Oh, they just say that they solved the problem by writing him off the show, or, like, killing him off. They wrote him off the show, yeah. They, they figured out a way to get rid of him on the show. They didn't kill him, though. Oh. Like, they figured I out thought some they, way. I thought they just... meant he died in real life, so they wrote him off the show. Like, they said he died in the show. Yeah, no. Candle that, once fully melted, will return the Green Ranger powers to her. Why the hell she never unveiled this until now is a good question, but the point is that Tommy is going to lose his powers. Still, as evil plans go, this is certainly better than her usual rigmarole of trying to ruin the teenager's days by sending putties to cause minor inconveniences. Plus, as the spoony one once pointed out, using a candle to take over the world. Well, that's pretty hardcore. The Rangers fought valiantly, and Jason himself tried to stop the candle, but ultimately failed. In order to prevent Rita from getting her hands on the Green Ranger powers, Tommy transfers them to Jason, granting him his shield and the dragon flute. Jason's failure to stop the Green Candle is something that would haunt him next season, but we'll get to that next time. Writing the Green Ranger out was also a brilliant move from a marketing perspective. Tommy was a popular character, and instead of overexposing him, limiting his appearances for special occasions later meant that kids would be more inclined to tune in in the hopes of seeing him during True the that. Bear idea. in mind, they didn't actually need to write him out of the show, especially for what they ended up doing later for the season. But this little bit of continuity really helps ensure that there is an ongoing story and makes kids want to see what the next episode is going to be like. Which brings us to Return of an Old Friend. Rita finally comes up with a plan that's not completely nonsensical and goofy, which is kidnap the teen's parents and ransom them for the power coins. Mm -hmm. They also take control of Billy's mind and force him to Genius. take the dragon dagger. This is the first time we actually see their parents, and in true silly fashion, most of them dress color-coded like their mm -hmm. kids, with Jason's parents wearing red and Skull's parents wearing punk attire. In fact, Bulk's parents seem the most normal. Our heroes really are forced cool, to give up the coins, yeah, but of course Goldar doesn't hold up his end of the bargain and keeps the parents. However, oh, Jason snap. reveals that he still has the dragon coin. They recruit Tommy once again and infuse him with Zordon's own energy. However, they know it's only a temporary measure and it's likely the powers could give out during a fight. After one of those fights, Tommy's able to retrieve the dagger and the power coins. And while he's now back as the Green Ranger, the group knows that the rejuvenation of his powers is only temporary. 
Besides for the running subplot of Tommy and Kimberly's relationship, there was also Zack's pursuit of Angela, who would brush him off any time he tried to impress her. It was actually a nice change to see that the teens weren't successful at everything they did, like it seemed to be, though Angela's heart seemed to be won over whenever Zack did genuinely good things for her. Or when he bribed her. The character pretty much disappeared, though, so ultimately it was for naught. One particular aspect that occurred to me as I was watching the later episodes of the season was the change in fighting prowess. In the early episodes, the rangers tended to fight off putties successfully only after they'd morphed. Otherwise, they relied on tricks or misdirection in order to defeat them. In fact, Tommy's ability to fight off a squad of putties single-handedly was an impressive feat to Rita. However, in a later episode, Zack was able to fight off a squad of putties himself, too. Billy's fighting ability in particular would change. In the beginning, he could barely fight off one putty, let alone a whole group of them, but by the end, he was able to hold his own in a fight beyond the stereotypical nature of his character. Mind you, some of this was simply narrative convenience, but it did hang in my mind as I was watching. As I said before, there was a problem of the fight scene footage. Originally, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers was only supposed to be 40 episodes, ending on the two-parter Doomsday. It's a pretty intense episode, with things looking grim, even parts of the Zord getting sliced off, but of course they win through at the end. Zordon of offers them a chance to give up their powers, that they shouldn't have to keep up the fight forever, but they say they'll keep going. I imagine the original plan was for Rita to be destroyed, hence the offer, but of course she was not. With the ever-growing popularity of the series, they decided to keep it on. But the first season, uniquely enough, had 60 episodes in it. So Damn. how did they fill up the remaining 20? They actually contacted the creators of Jew Rangers to produce entirely new original footage that would only be used in Power Rangers, oh, referred damn. to by fans as Jew 2. Just damn! That's cool. The problem that Power Rangers continually face throughout its existence is its low budget, yet what the hell kind of budget did this first season have? While dubbing a show is by no means a cheap process, it would have been considerably cheaper than continually producing original footage with all these characters, having the new footage made by the Japanese producers, and, as we'll see, all new sets and villains made exclusively for this show. Now, as yeah. I said at the introduction, I started noticing an underlying theme of this season, or at least a motif. It's likely not something that was intentional on the part of the writers, but I feel like it's there regardless. A continual struggle between magic, or at least steampunk fantasy for Rita, and technology for the Rangers. While both sides of the conflict utilize magic or technology, their methodology and surroundings are completely on opposite sides. Rita's palace is full of magic trinkets, and its overall atmosphere is meant to evoke a witch's lair. Her monster-making machine turns clay figures and pops them out as actual living beings. She has a magic wand to make her monsters grow, and she routinely uses magic items to achieve her goals, either calling upon some ancient spirit or, say, using a candle to take away superpowers. Even the monsters themselves tended to have a more mythological or mystical bent to them, or at the very least, range in the fantastic. On the other side of the fence are the Power Rangers. The command center is a high-tech facility, and the morphers themselves are an impressive feat of technology, accessing something called the Morphing Grid to give them their powers. While Zordon may have been described as a wizard before they fleshed out his backstory, he clearly prefers the use of the technology that the group has at their disposal. Alpha himself is a robot, and the Rangers use giant machines yeah. to fight against Rita's magically created monsters. Billy is usually the tech go-to guy, and also invents new devices to help the team out. Hell, a little kid friend of his, who I swear is supposed to be his brother, even invents a virtual boy. Some little kid invented a virtual boy. Technology is presented as something extraordinarily necessary and useful to the team and the world at large. Mysticism and magic, while useful sometimes, are presented as tools of evil. What's interesting about this is that by the time we reach Zeo, that position will have swung more towards a balance. One thing I definitely neglected to mention originally was, well, the pretty obvious Wizard of Oz connections. I'm not sure how much of that was actually part of Jew Ranger's inception, but it's pretty cool how much of an influence it had. You've got a giant floating head referred to as a wizard, which, considering they change his backstory slightly a bit later to be an alien, could be considered the man behind the curtain idea. An evil witch, whom even Barbara Goodson, the voice actor, was told to do a Wicked Witch of the West impersonation, who had at her disposal a flying monkey. It's okay to wear your influences on your sleeve like this and He's really so show right. how creative you can get with it. I mean, it's not like the show actually has a Dorothy figure. 
Although I've got to imagine somewhere in 800 episodes they had magic shoes. There are other characters on the show, but unfortunately they're kind of superfluous. There's Miss Appleby, the teacher at Angel Grove High who shows up the most. Principal Kaplan, who is really just there for the occasional comic relief when his toupee gets knocked off because mm -hmm. baldness is funny, I guess. It but is. the other most recurring character is, of course, Ernie, owner of the juice bar. Yes, I feel sad I that he never that. really did much on the show aside from occasionally helping out the teens with something they were doing because he has kind of a quiet charm to him, like the friendly barkeep who's always there to dispense sage wisdom. Hell, if I was writing this nowadays, I'd make Zordon the mentor who could help them with larger-than-life stuff while Ernie would be the one to help them with stuff all too human. Overall, the success of the show was probably not built on the most engaging of circumstances. While the acting is mixed in the early episodes, the characters do all eventually grow into a position where they're completely believable in their roles, as long as you ignore them preaching about community this and environmentalism that and teamwork and all that crap. Guest characters would be the worst actors, since it comes off as not knowing if they should take their material seriously, or in some cases, they're just terrible actors. Like the aforementioned episode with Billy's not brother, with lots of people clearly <laughs> dubbed brother. in. I owe you an apology, Billy. It seems I overreacted to something that wasn't your fault. If I had to speculate, yeah. what I'd say really helped its success was the action. No other American show at the time was showing such complex fighting and choreography. And while the monsters were silly and the jokes were cheesy, there was something of a basic charm to the series that made people, especially kids, want to watch it. The growth of good storylines aided it, especially multi-partners where the stakes were high and you honestly weren't sure how they were going to resolve the situations. And while there were, of course, those times when logic broke through and you asked, say, if Rita knows their identities, why doesn't she blow up their houses? But all in all, the first season was a good start to the show, even if 60 episodes was a bit much, especially when one considers that most of them followed the same damn formula. However, things would only go uphill in terms of storytelling in season two. Oh, oh snap, season two. When we get to Zerg, or whatever his name is. Who's the big red guy with the horn on his head? I forget. <laughs> he was, he's the ultimate bad guy. Zerg, Zergum. Zardon's a good I don't know I forget his name now it's been so long well if you enjoyed that video make sure you go and subscribe yes before very... we continue it's the link's in the description and the name of the channel is Lankara atop the fourth wall he kind of not continuously talks so not too much to say in between there but right money more from Power Rangers season one right there it was good that they wrote Tommy off though because they made use of what they had they had fighting footage that they had to use and they had to make a storyline that fit up to that but that was pretty silly when they first turn into Power Rangers. They go from being here to being on top of a fucking like skyscraper. Jesus, we're both so full of cat hair. I know, um, yeah, I agree. I see, and I never, when I was younger, I never actually got into the show because I was a girl, and I still am a girl. But just letting you know, I oh. was, I was a girl <laughs> when no I was way. little, <laughs> and uh, I just feel like. You know, and there might be some girls out there that enjoy the show, but I was a girly girl and I just wasn't into it. But breaking the show down like that kind of looks pretty interesting. Like, I feel like if I would have given it, given it a shot, I would have probably enjoyed it. Yeah, I think there's something there for everybody. Guys, go check out the channel and we'll catch you in the next one. Peace out. Bye.